Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, and uh, happy also that we have uh, a generous amount of time. Uh, history is uh, something that I, I have a great interest in, and I also regard myself to be an educator, but I never studied education. So, a lot of the questions that you have, and a lot of the ways that you have of looking at education and the product that it produces in the students, I, I was never trained that way. So, therefore, when you ask a lot of these questions, um, I don't probably understand them like you understand them. But um, I think by give and take, and by your asking questions, and explaining what you want to me if I don't understand, then we can probably uh, arrive at something that is useful for you. For me, um, the study of history is so important that it doesn't really need much uh, justification. And no doubt that's because of the fact that in my own life, um, it was the study of history that changed everything. <clears throat> when I went to the University of Missouri uh, at 16 years of age, um, I really wanted to know the truth. And that, that was actually what motivated me through all my undergraduate career. Like, what is the truth? What is reality? Uh, why are we here? Um, career didn't mean anything to me. I never, in, for a moment in education, well, I wouldn't say that starkly, but like, what are you going to do with this? That did not occur to me. And I went to college in 1964. That was, you know, when the 1960s were beginning to heat up. And of course, then I was in the whole reality and turmoil of the 1960s. And a lot of us, including myself, it's like, really all we care about is like, what are we doing here? Why are we living here? And we were questioning the views of our parents and all sorts of paradigms. I was never a hippie. I like to always explain that because I didn't like the hippies. But I was very politicized and I was very concerned with philosophy and understanding when I began at the University of Missouri, I had to take a world history class, world civilization. And the professor was a very good professor. He was the head of the department. His name was Professor Nowert. And um, when he talked about the history of the past and the church and how Christianity had been changed and things like that, this really affected me profoundly. Like, this is what I want to know. And um, so then I decided to study history. And history became my first major. Then I took English literature later as a second major, again to try to discover reality, because I saw that philosophy, I saw that history cannot really be meaningful if you don't have a philosophy of history. You have to have a conception of what you believe to be true. Or otherwise, you know, you will drown in all these facts. And so then where do you find the truth? So I looked at psychology and I looked at philosophy. And then to me, literature became the most inviting of all those subjects because of the way that literary <coughs> criticism is done, you know, which involves things like studying the history that is behind the literature, the sociology that's reflected in it. And then people like Shakespeare and Milton, they go into the psychological dimensions of human beings and things like that. So, um, but for me, history was really an important study. And um, one of the most important things, and I, I hope this responds to the questions that were just raised, but, uh, you know, when you look at history, and when we look at everything, uh, we have to look at paradigms and cognitive frames that what are the conceptions that we bring with us. And uh, we have to be really critical about that. And I think that 
As educators, the most important thing to focus on are the paradigms and the cognitive frames. So uh, today, um, I probably will just give you uh, a little history lesson in, in which we look at uh, the effect of paradigms and cognitive frames. And um, you know, we can also see, perhaps, how uh, the secularist view um, imposes its own extremely anemic and empty cognitive frames on reality and distorts the whole view of history. And uh, we, uh, we have a responsibility as Muslims you know, to set our own cognitive frames. And, uh, you know, in other words, like, how, how do we view reality? And um, what are the prisms through which we see reality? And, you know, when we look at history at that, you'll see that history is extremely rich, and history is extremely untapped. And we have a major responsibility to uh, study history, to research history, to write history. Um, today, in the time we have, we probably will only be able to talk about some about very few things. But I hope even in talking about them, you'll see how rich these, these subjects are. And how you present that to a child or to an elementary student or a middle school student or a high school student, you know, that's what you have to figure out as an educator regarding whatever it is that you teach or a university professor. But this is extremely important. And, you know, we have to emphasize the fact that facts never speak for themselves. You know, it's often said, right, that let the facts speak for themselves. No, facts never speak for themselves. They can't do that. Facts must be interpreted. Facts have to be interpreted. And the way that we interpret facts is through what we call paradigms and cognitive frames. Some people uh, might use paradigm and cognitive frame as essentially the same thing. Uh, I don't have an adequate philosophical training or epistemological training to be able to say really how they should be used. But when I use it, the paradigms are the big cognitive frames. And then you have cognitive frames tend to be often a lot smaller. You know, so for example, um, you know, if we take Darwinian evolutionary theory and the different views of history that come out of that, the different views of the universe that come out of that, that's a big paradigm in my use of the word. And then you have a lot of cognitive frames, like for example, primitive religion, primitive people. And when we look at that, like what are primitive people? What do you know about primitive people? You know, and, and really most of what is believed about primitive people is nothing but a projection of the inadequacy of Darwinian theory. It, it's not true. It's not true, and it's certainly not a closed case. Okay, so that, so like primitive people, um, you know, that's a cognitive frame which is part of a paradigm, which is the Darwinian paradigm. As much as that paradigm has changed. Okay, so um, you know, cognitive frames are the way we understand. This is what enables us to understand. Paradigms are the big pictures. And we put the cognitive frames in them. And you know, this is really important. You know, for example, are men superior to women? Does Islam teach that? That's not the way Islam actually talks about people. Islam talks about responsibility. Really, you have, that's, the, that's, our, that's our cognitive frame. And we have a narrative. So the fact is that men are burdened with greater responsibility than women. That's what it says, Right? That men have authority. Well, they translate it different ways, but really it's because men have certain responsibilities 
in the law that women don't have. Why? Because women bear children. Because women are mothers, potentially. And because in that they have to be sheltered. There are certain things they cannot usually do. So the men have to do that. Doesn't mean that the men are superior to the women. Uh, why do women not have to pray German prayers? It's because they're not responsible to do that. And this is actually a mercy for them. That's the way we look at it in the Sharia, because it's like you have been removed from this responsibility. Why do women, you know, a woman can transmit a, a hadith, and the hadith is completely sahih, but why do you need two women witnesses in a court of law? In certain matters, especially monetary matters. Because of responsibility. Why? Because it's not a question, is, is she truthful or anything like that? But it's like when you go to a court of law, there's all sorts of things that happen. You know, so let's say, for example, that, that you witnessed that so-and-so loaned me $10,000 and not $1,000, like I say. And then you're going to go to the court of law and say that, no, it was $10,000. And if I'm a powerful person, I may be able to put tremendous pressure on you to intimidate you. So therefore, you have two women. That makes it easier. That makes it easier. <coughs> That's what a lot of our people have said. But this is according about responsibilities. So again, we have to get the cognitive frame right. That why are you saying superior to? We're not talking about hierarchy of being. But we're talking about responsibilities. And if you have more responsibilities, and you fulfill your responsibilities, then in the garden, you will have a great reward. And your degree may be higher than so-and-so. And if you don't fulfill your responsibility, you'll be lower than the law. So that tells us more about superiority. It does never in this world. It's like, did you keep your responsibility? Most of, of us probably here, I don't know many of you, and I don't know your backgrounds, but a lot of us come from really um, privileged backgrounds. Right? I've never been hungry a day in my life. You know, I was allowed to study anything I wanted. I could go to any school I wanted to. Um, you know, I had good health. Uh, alhamdulillah, I had wonderful parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. Great-grandparents who told me about America back in the 1860s and 70s and how they went west on the cover wagons and how they were afraid of the rivers because it's so difficult to go across the river in the wagon. They weren't afraid about Native Americans or anything like that. But like the rivers, that was a big fear. Oh, here's another river. We've got to take the, the wagon across the river and we may all drown. We may lose everything. You know? So this means people like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He comes from a very blessed background. Look at his father, look at his mother. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that, that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has immense responsibility. And alhamdulillah, he fulfills it. He strives to fulfill it. And you also probably like that as well. You know, you were able to go to university. You were able to study. You probably made good grades. Your parents probably took good care of you. So that means you have huge responsibility. And you have to fulfill that. And if you do, you'll be superior. You'll be given a high degree. You know, some of the questions we had on Saturday about abuse and about insanity and things like that. And, you know, the one brother, Oscar, asked the question about people that grow up, you know, where all they know is drugs and prostitution <coughs> and crime and things like that. And, you know, I'm trying to answer that question, you know, it's like, you know, those people, a person like that, God does not hold them responsible for what he holds you for, responsible for. Because you're able, you know, you, you were not blighted by that test. People like that, if they can come out of the test, then they will be giants. You know, diamonds are made from what? Coal. You take the coal, you know, which is only good for burning, and you put it in the heat under immense pressure for years, and it may turn into a diamond. You know? So uh, we have to get paradigms and cognitive frames Right, I and mean, you've got to always look for the paradigm. Look for the cognitive frame. You've got to flesh it out. And in the way we speak, the language that we use, this is really, really important.
So we will give you some examples of that, but I want to, you know, it is not a valid view of the world. And uh, secularists are extremely intolerant. And the sec and seculars impose their worldview on us many times. It's like, where will you get the academic establishment if you don't cater to evolution? You know, you'll have a hard time because that's the golden calf. And it's a ridiculous idea. It has no metaphysical merit whatsoever. Chance cannot account for anything. Random does not exist in the metaphysical world, in the real world. God creates as he wills to create. And species are among the most incredible things that he creates. And species are demarked. One species never leads to another species. We have no indication of that in history whatsoever. You know, but, uh, but Herbert Butterfield, he said that, and he wanted to defend historians like himself, who wanted to be honest, but who were not committed to secular uh, points of view. And we are certainly not committed to a secular point of view. And he said, the blindness of the blind, the blindest of the blind, the blindest of the blind, are those who are unable to examine their own presuppositions. The blindest of the blind are those who are unable to examine their own presuppositions. Presuppositions being cognitive frames and paradigms and other things like values and blithely imagine happily imagine, and no big deal, blithely imagine, therefore, that they do not possess it. That, that's really important. And, and this is one of the most important things that we have to do today, is, you know, to flesh out what are the presumptions in our books? What are the cognitive frames? What are the paradigms? And then, is that valid? Is it not? But to assume that, well, I don't have any. You know, I'm just objective. Like he said, those are the blindest of the blind. People who, as he said, the blindest of the blind are those who are unable to examine their own presupp presuppositions. And we cannot make any progress in education or science or history or anything else until we are able to examine presuppositions and cognitive frames. You know, if you look at the greatness of someone like uh, Albert Einstein, one of the greatnesses of Einstein is that he is able to examine the presuppositions of the Newtonian world. You know, and if you look at things like quantum mechanics, that in quantum mechanics it's like you see that the Newtonian paradigm, the Newtonian physics is based on a paradigm that the structure of reality is based on the wave and the, what do you call it, the particle. The particle and the wave. That's the great dualism of Newtonian physics. And for hundreds of years, Westerners believed that everything in reality could be studied and could be predicted on the basis of understanding points and waves. Then you get to quantum mechanics, and Einstein also is one of the people you know, who's pushing in that direction, and all of a sudden the point and the wave cannot be distinguished anymore. You know, so the ability to accept things like that, the ability to examine cognitive frames, this is really, really important. The greatness of Malcolm X, and Hajmani, uh, Shahbaz, Royal Falcon, Shahbaz, he said, but Shahbaz is from Shahbaz, Royal Falcon, you know, Feta, noble youth, you know, uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadim Jilani, Shahbaz. One of the greatest things about Malcolm is he's always able to re-examine the way he thinks, his cognitive frame. And if he sees it doesn't work, he will change it. That takes genius. That's why Malcolm X is a genius. Malcolm X was a brilliant And it's courageous, too, because he will scrap the cognitive frame if he finds that it doesn't work anymore. And he will look for one that is greater. So, um, the blindest of the blind are people who cannot do that. Most human beings cannot do that. Most human beings, and even most thinkers, most academicians, are not capable of examining 
their paradigms in cognitive frames. They can't do that. And we, and we will see when we look at some of these examples that they're afraid to do that. We'll look, for example, at the, the Thamudic script. You believe in Thamud. Thamud did exist. Without any question, they exist. And they have a script called Thamudic, which we'll look at. But how, where do you date it? And how do you date it? And so they will say, well, we'll date that around 500, 600 BC. Why? Because if they date it another 600 years back, they will blow up everything that they believe to be true about the ancient Middle East. So I can't go there. I've got to protect the hypothesis. One of the fallacies of thought, you know, and fallacies are really important to study. You know, I, I think that's one of the, logic is important, but one of the most important things in logic that I believe we should be teaching people from the beginning are fallacies. Fallacies. You know, for example, you don't speak of individuals as you speak of groups. Don't speak of an individual as you speak of a group. You know, we talk about the will of a nation. Okay, and we might talk about the will of, like, the white middle class in America, in, in Tea Party America. Right? Okay, so that's a valid statement. We can make generalizations about Tea Partiers, or think, oh, about the will of the nation sometimes, like World War II. But you cannot assume that every individual that is in that nation has that worldview. See, that's a fallacy, and it's a very common fallacy. It's a very common fallacy. So fallacies are very important. Saving the hypothesis is a very important hypothesis. A fallacy. Because it's like, if I accept this uh, paradigm that you're ta talking about, if I accept, if, for example, we date the Mudic script at 2000 BC, I would say the date is 7000 BC. You know, then uh, all the hypotheses about the ancient Middle East are turned upside down. Everything has to be rethought. Everything has to be writ re rewritten. And academicians don't like that. Mm -hmm. they don't. And so academicians will defend their hypotheses to the death. <laughs> you know, we can prove that Muslims came to the Americas at least 200 years before Columbus. I can prove it to you that the, the king, the Mandinka king of Mali, sent 2,400 boats across the Atlantic filled with Mandinka warriors and Bambara warriors. 1312. Why would he do a thing like that? Because he knows how to cross the Atlantic anyway. And we can talk about why he knew that. There's lots of reasons why he did it. But there's gold in Bambara Hills. You know, that you go to America, you get gold, and the kingdom of Mali was based on gold. It controlled the gold markets of the world. That's why he, he even gives up his throne to lead that journey. And then we know that they were there because we have terracottas, which a lot of you have seen, of mandinkas in ancient America that are so perfectly done that we can identify their tribe and their profession. It's amazing. And from when do we date them? About 1300 BC, 1300 of the Common Era. So these are among the warriors who came over. But like, do you think that's easy to prove? It's easy to prove to uh, a lot of African Americans because they didn't buy into the cognitive frame. And this is empowering for them. But for a lot of whites, especially Tea Party whites, no sir. Because like you're going to blow, you know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Absolute nonsense. Okay, so uh, they will defend the hypothesis. They will defend it. In fact, the terracottas of the Mandinkas who came to the Americas in the 14th century, uh, a German, an Austrian, I think he's an Austrian, discovered them from uh, Wutnau is his name. And uh, he discovered them in the basement of the National Museum of Mexicans. Because, like, the Mexicans didn't really want to be descendants of black ancestors. Even though the Mandinkas are noble people. 
But see, even there, it's like, and then also even Native Americans, it's like, what, you're going to make us Africans? You know, in other words, like, we're not worth anything? We didn't make, so there's all sorts of minefields that are there and hypotheses that people are going to defend. That's why when we talk, write about things like this and talk about things like this, you have to be really careful about how you do it. Uh, simply because uh, you are threatening, you are empowering certain people. I think everything we talk about today, I would doubt that anyone here would have any problem with it, because it is something that confirms our worldview. But other people know that's not true. They will balk every inch of the way, because you are leading them down a path where their cognition doesn't work. You're altering their cognitive frames. You're threatening the way they interpret reality. And many people won't let you do that. So um, Butterfield said that, and then Arnold Toynbee is one of the great historians of our time. Arnold Toynbee, he regarded the secularist who is blind of his own suppositions. And Toynbee writes a lot about that. Toynbee detested that. You know, like if you want to, if you are, don't believe in God, you don't believe in religion, you know, you're free to do whatever you want, but don't impose your worldview on me. And uh, Toynbee regarded the secularist who is blind to his own suppositions to be like a prisoner who pronounces himself free because he is unconscious of his chains. The secularist who is blind to his own suppositions is like a prisoner who pronounces himself free because he is unconscious of his chains. Mm -hmm. um, then I wanted to look at um, uh, a beautiful statement from Al-Amiri. Al-Amiri uh, was a Muslim thinker who uh, died at the end of the 10th century. It's about uh, 100 years before Imam al-Ghazali and Sheikh al-Qadr Jilani. He was from Central Asia, and he, he is very intelligent. He writes really interesting things. But he says, this is really nice, knowledge is the starting point of action. And I think this is really useful for us. Knowledge is the starting point of action. Action is the perfection of knowledge. They both go together. Knowledge is the starting point of action. Action is the perfection of knowledge. Superior types of knowledge are only desirable for the sake of the useful types, for the sake of useful types of action. You know, so, and I, and I, think, I think that you'll see that, uh, you know, history, history is really critical material because history has so much to do with what you believe to be true, what you believe to be false, um, how you understand the Qur'an, how you fail to understand the Qur'an. The Qur'an is historically a mirror, really and truly. But you have to know a lot about history to know that, really and truly. In a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The Qur'an requires great knowledge. It requires profound knowledge. Especially because the Qur'an never addresses the Bible, for example. What is the Bible? The Bible is a very special and minor part of the legacy of the children of Israel. The Qur'an addresses the whole reality of the children of Israel. And it tells them about the things that they differed about. And most of what is preserved are the things that they differed about mistakenly. And so the Qur'an will tell us, for example, that Jesus was not crucified. They did not crucify him, they did not kill him. But it was made so to appear, shubbihan. And what was the first thing that the Christians disagreed about? Who knows? Atika, do you know? What was the first thing the Christians disagreed about? This is really important because, you know, after the fight and all the broken china, then the victor sweeps out the garbage or puts it under the carpet. So you don't know what really happened. But the first great debate in Christianity was about crucifixion. 
was Jesus the Christ or not? Because if he is the Christ, if he is the Messiah, you can't crucify him. That's the definition of Messiah. The Messiah is a victor. T.S. Eliot refers to Christ as the tiger. Christ the tiger. And Jesus said, I did not. He said, John baptizes with water. I baptize with fire and the sword. In other words, I'm the Messiah. The Messiah is a man of war. And Satan, when he tempts Jesus in the Bible, and he puts him up on the parapets of the temple, he says, cast thyself down. Throw yourself out to the wind. Jump. Because the angels will pick you up. Is that not true? Are you not the Messiah? Because it is written that you will not, you, the Messiah, Satan, Shaitan knows who he is, that you will not stumble on a stone, but that the angels will pick you up, because that's the Messiah. You're going to crucify him? Never. You will not. He will be delivered. And in, in traditional belief of the rabbis and the children of Israel, the Messiah cannot be harmed. The Messiah cannot be touched. That's why Paul, who believed that Christ was crucified, he says that the crucifixion is an escandal. It's a scandal. The Greek word scandalon means a stumbling block. Because who can accept that? No one can accept it. Like, like this is proof that Jesus was not the Christ. <clears throat> if you killed him, that's why the Jews say, we killed uh, the Messiah, the son of Mary. You know, in other words, like he was not the Messiah, you know, because we killed him. And our killing him shows that he couldn't deliver himself. But, uh, you know, St. Jerome says the blood of Christ, whom he believes was crucified, we could say the blood of the crucified, had not dried in the earth, the soil of Jerusalem, but that there were those who said, it is not him. It is one who looks like him. And in Greek, they use the word dokein. Dokein, which means the same as shubia. Exactly the same. They say, shoot me now. And these were called docetics. D-O-C-E-T-I-C. -E docetics. And many early Christians were docetics. And the Quran comes to say that they were right and you were wrong. Sorry, you missed the boat. The docetics were right. You killed them all. You got rid of them. You know, you, you closed that chapter of history and you know, as if it never was. But this was your first issue. Like, is that Jesus? Because like, it's like, they can't crucify him. He is the Messiah. And people say, and it's not him. It looks like him, but look at the lower body. And even in the, in the Gospels, as they are transmitted to us today, the church Gospels, they say that Christ, when he's carrying the cross, stumbles to the ground. And then another man has to come and pick up the cross and carry it for him as a mercy to him. And this is not Jesus Christ. Because the Messiah is strong. And the prophets and the messengers are strong. You know, you take the strongest wrestler in Arabia, and the prophet, who is not a wrestler, someone throws him to the ground. And he said, no, no, you have to give me another chance. Said, you did something. I went, does it again. Does it again. Then he said, I should have done that. You know, this is, you know, like, so this is not normal. This is not usual. The prophet is very strong because the prophets and the messengers were the most perfect of all human beings. They were the most intelligent. And they were also physically strong. And Jesus was like that too. So who is this man who's stumbling? Is he, this is an ordinary human being. And they say he looks like Jesus in the upper body, but he looks different in the lower body. These things are really important. And if you look up at docetic in the internet, I think you might be discouraged. If you want to look at a good uh, article on docetism, then you could look at the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. And I think you can look at the article of docetism. And, uh, the, and he will show you that docetic, for example, the Christians know today, uh, maybe they've heard some of us talk, 
You know, the Christians always are trying to cover their weak spots. But, you know, they, they, so they will present, they'll send this to you as if, this is just a Gnostic idea that some early Christians have. No, docetism was never identified with any sect, not the Gnostics or anybody else. Although all the Gnostics of Christianity were docetic, except for maybe one. You know, but it was not a sectarian view, it was an early Christian view, docetism. And, um, you know, uh, all of the apocrypha, all of the books that are not canonical books of the Bible, you know, that are not accepted by the truth. All of the Apocrypha that give what we call the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Disciples of Christ, they're all docetic, except for one. For example, the Acts of John, John is sitting on Mount Olives, the Mount of Olives, and he's looking at uh, Calvary, where the crucifixion took place, and he is, he is depressed. He's crying. As I, I believe it says. And then it says, Jesus comes to him on the mountain, and he says, John, I'm Jesus. This is, this is I. And that's someone else that they crucified. Uh, very, very interesting. So, I mean, the Quran is really amazing. Really amazing. We could, we could talk about many aspects of that. The, the first Surah Al-Baqarah is addressed to whom? Who is Surah Al-Baqarah addressed to? Or one of the main... Sorry? Uh, well, let's say the Jews. Right. There's also the Christians of Bani Israel. See, that's also very important to know that. Christianity is totally a Bani Israel phenomenon. It will declare itself not to be. But the reality... These are also paradigms and cognitive frames. We have to get them right. Which religion is older? Christianity or Judaism? <laughs> Who would know? What, what, what do you say? Judaism. Okay, what is older, Christianity or Judaism? Judaism. Yeah, Christianity. They're, they're both about the same age. Because you don't refer to the children of Israel before Jesus usually as Jews. <laughs> we sometimes do, and, and sometimes you can do that. It's very rare. Um, the Jew. Uh, and, and Jews, as they emerge in history, they emerge after the mission of Jesus Christ. And they grow out of the development of the Talmud, of the Mishnah and the Gemara. And these are written in the first century, the third century, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth centuries. And one of the main goals of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, as it develops after Christianity, is to get the Judaic Christian out of the church. Because the, the great threat to the Jews was not the Trinitarian Christian. It is the Judaic Christian. The Jew who believes in Moses and follows the law of Moses, but also believes in Jesus, the son of Mary, as the Messiah. And probably uh, a lot of the Jews, some of the Jews of Medina were Judaic Christians. Abdullah ibn Salam, for example. May well have been a Judaic Christian. Okay? And these are like Jews, but they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they still want to live with the Jews. Because, you know, they eat their food and they pray their prayer. And, you know, they circumcise their boys, their children, and, and stuff like that. And so it's like you have to get them out. And this is why when the Talmud is attacking Christians, it's always attacking Jewish Christians. Judaic Christians, not attacking the Roman Christians, because they don't care about those. These are Trinitarians. No Jew's going to be tempted to follow them. Like, this is crazy. You believe that God is the triune God? Like, no Jew's going to believe that. But you believe that Moses was a prophet, you follow the law of Moses, and then you say the son of Mary was the Messiah, No, that we don't accept. You know, um, in any case, uh, useful knowledge. Useful knowledge enables us to be better and to do what is good. Uh, we have an ethics of thought, study, and research. So that's the point that I want to make there. And this is actually based on the writings of Sheikh uh, Hassan Haban, may Allah have mercy on him, who is one of our contemporary scholars. That we, and, and, and he refers to this also, that useful knowledge is knowledge that enables us to be better and to do what is good. 
And of course, as Muslims, we seek useful knowledge. And useful knowledge is vast. And history is useful knowledge. It's very important knowledge. And we have an ethics of thought. We have to think right. We have an ethics of study. And we have an ethics of research. Seeking the truth. We don't want to distort things. We don't want to cover things up. There are people who do that. Who, who, who weed out the weeds of history so that things um, we must seek out true and beneficial knowledge. Now one of the things that Sheikh Abdul Rahman Habanda, uh, Hassan Habanda says is um, ethics in Islam are not restricted to the realm of action alone, but encompass all aspects of human behavior inward and outward. Thus we have an ethics of thought, study, and research. Just as we have an ethics of day-to-day -day social interaction, part of our ethics of thought, and this should be emphasized in the present information age, is to seek out beneficial knowledge, avoiding what is worthless and detrimental, and separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, and these are my words, those are actually my words, the last ones were. Uh, knowledge of the past, prehistory, and history belongs to superior knowledge and begets useful action. It does. It gives you your identity. It's very important. Very important. If you believe that Muslims didn't do anything in history, and you think that all we did was fight with each other and betray the trust and like, you know, um, just, you know, one problem after another, then how do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about your religion? You know, when you know that Muslims did things like we developed paper, we made it accessible to people, we developed the numerical system so that we could facilitate um, uh, calculation. We are the ones who are the major influence that leads to the rise of colleges in the West, and the PhD, and academic freedom, and the professorial chair, and that humanism in the West also comes from us. Then you have a different view of yourself. Right? And if, if you also are an American and you know that Muslims were here before the Europeans, you don't think that affects you? You know, uh, when Cortez conquers Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, what did he find there? You know what he found, right? What did he find? He said, I found in it many mosques, muchas mezquitas, y teocales, and pagan temples, y casas bonitas and beautiful houses. And Pizarro says the same thing about where he goes. And even in New Mexico, the Spanish believed that the Apaches had among them Muslims and were doing jihad, and that they prayed like Muslims in their camps. Okay, and today we say like, well, what crazy people, they thought there were Muslims in America. Can you believe that? They thought there were Muslims in America before we got here. No, you have to take that seriously. Uh, there definitely were Muslims here before the Europeans. And we, but we will prove that. We will prove it. And almost certainly <clears throat> they had some kind of influence on the Native Americans. Not to say all Native Americans were Muslims, no. But probably there was a compatibility between those of them who were Muslims and those who were not. And these are very important things to study. So, um, knowledge of the past, prehistory and history, belongs to superior knowledge and begets useful action. It has a special relation to Islam because it enables us to discover the truth of the divine message. It gives us identity. It gives us self-confidence. It gives us self-respect. Um, certainty of faith. It increases sound faith and emotional attachment to the religion and to the lands and the peoples and the languages that we uh, hold dear and that are essential to our religion. And I think that you'll see that these things we talk about today, they all fall under that heading. Um, now, uh, I'd like to sort of begin as much at the beginning as we can, even though to do that we should even talk about things like the origins of the universe and Big Bang Theory 
and uh, evolution, evolutionary theory and stuff, but we won't do that today. In Akita, that's very appropriate to do. And even here, it would be appropriate to do, but let's just look at human history. And first of all, we look at things like the Old Stone Age, the New, old, new Stone Age. What is the Stone Age? Do you know? The <coughs> Stone Age. We have Old Stone Age, Paleolithic. And we have New Stone Age, Neolithic. That's prehistory. Um, what are we talking about when we talk about Stone Age people? Pre-civilization. And what are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about civilization? Cities and town cities. System. Cities. That's all you're talking about. Cities. Okay. So the, the Stone Age is an age that is before cities. Did Abraham live in a city? You know when he went, when he made his migration? Probably lived in a tent. Um, was Ibrahim was Abraham primitive? Um, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu lived in houses of clay, and he, no doubt, and often he would be in tents as well. Um, was he primitive? Um, you know why is it that the building of cities is so important for us in the definition of humanity? A lot of traditional thought in the world, Greek and. and Indic and others believe that cities are actually the manifestation of the decay of humanity. Okay, the, the cities produce the worst people and the worst situations. So, um, you know, th this is very important. First of all, um, uh, Arabia, and we, we will probably we, we'll talk about Arabia a little bit today as much as we find it appropriate and we have time. But the Arabian Peninsula is a Neolithic treasure chest. It's never been studied, really. Only barely been studied. The Neolithic period is usually dated in Arabia something like 7,000 BC to about 3,000 BC. <coughs> and the things that are before that, you know, and today we often believe that history goes back a long time. Um, how we believe that, why we believe that, are things that also need to be studied carefully. I, I've never done that, but I just basically just accept what they say. But the Paleolithic, they usually put back to like 100,000 BC, up into about 7,000 BC. And what's the difference between the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age? The, in the New Stone Age, people become much more artistic. <clears throat> they begin to design things more. They put more uh, art in their implements and their axes and their arrows and things like that. So there's a, there's a difference between the Old Stone Age where they often make things, but they don't decorate them very much. They'll make axes and bows and they make um, different types of cleavers, you know, but they just use them. They don't really, uh, they don't decorate them very much. So that shows, of course, that they were primitive, right? Backward people. Why? Why does it do that? Do you think the Prophet Muhammad would have wasted his time um, to decorate his acts when there's so many other things to do, like pray or fast? I mean, if people want to do it, then fine. But, um, and so this is very important, is that what were people like in the Paleolithic? And Arnold Toynbee is among the people who believes that the most superior of all human beings were those of the Paleolithic. And he believes that when you look at the Neolithic, you see a very distinctive spiritual decline. So that's very important. That's very important. And, you know, we won't go into that in great depth, you know, but uh, that's very important. But Neolithic Arabia, which is Arabia you know, uh, 7,000 B.C., 6,000 B.C., is rich, full of treasures, full of interesting things. Uh, you, some people say you can't walk the distance of a football field in Arabia without stumbling over an ancient tomb or arrowhead or other remnant of the New, New Stone Age. All this needs to be studied. All needs to be studied very carefully. 
And interestingly, in ancient Arabia, in Neolithic Arabia, there were at least four races of people that were there. There were Semites. The Arabs are usually regarded as Semites. They were mostly in Central Arabia. At least we see their remnants in Central Arabia. And there were then Sumerians. Who are the Sumerians? The Sumerians. Who are they? Where, where, what did they do in history? We're going to talk about them a little bit more today. The Sumerians. These are the people that begin Babylonian or Iraqi civilization. And we don't know much about them. We don't know where their language came from, but they were in Arabia. They were there. There were also Egyptians. Egyptians who will lay the foundations of Egyptian civilization. And there were also um, Nubian type people. Black people. African looking people. You know, they were, they were there too. There are the four groups. Very, very interesting thing. And um, then all this begins to change at the end of the Neolithic. And one of the reasons why it begins to change is that the earth begins to dry up. And um, the ice pack of the Ice Age is melting. And this begins to change the whole configuration of, of human history. But, see, this is another thing. If you think about ancient civilization, ancient people who are worth talking about, who do you think about? The ancient Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, the Babylonians. You think about the ancient Egyptians, and you think maybe uh, about the ancient Chinese of the Yellow River Valley. Uh, these three represent uh, three major ancient civilizations, people who built cities. Uh, and again, it's like, this is why it's so important to get the paradigm right. That, in fact, are they ancient? That's a relative statement, right? But, like, with regard to the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, they're modern. And what they are doing, and this is really important, we have to keep our eyes on the ball, is that before that, people don't live in Egypt. They don't live in the Nile Valley. And they don't live in the Iraqi Mesopotamian River Valley. And they don't live in the Yellow River Valley of China. If you go in the Neolithic and you look at Egypt, you won't find hardly any human beings there. You will find some hunters who come in and go out, some fishers who come in and go out, and you find Neanderthals, who are not human beings. Apparently they're not human beings. They're not related to us in DNA, and they probably couldn't talk. Okay, but they were very strong people, and they're usually killed off by human beings in history, probably because they can't talk. You know, so they can't organize like you can. If you can talk, you can organize. You're very dangerous. But if they can just live together and work together, almost like animals, then they're very susceptible. So they say that the Neanderthals probably reproduce by coming together in certain grounds where they find spouses. Whether they married or not, we don't know. Whether they were Mukallaf or not, we don't know. But they have these customs, but they, those are the best lands. And human beings will take them away. They can't go back there anymore. And they can't find spouses. So they say that's maybe one way that they die off. They're also killed a lot by human beings. But um, in ancient Egypt, in the Neolithic and Paleolithic, there's nobody there. Why? Why? What was the Nile Valley like? Do you know? Is it because of seasonal flood? Uh, yeah, what would happen when the Nile would flood? It would flood you know, with immense floods that would flood the land a hundred miles to the east and maybe 50 miles or so to the west. And the floods are more powerful floods. And then also, if the flood is gone and the Nile appears, 
Can you get to the river? There's papyrus everywhere. Papyrus will cut you to bits. And there are hippopotamuses that are very dangerous. There are crocodiles that are very dangerous. There are disease. There's disease. There are serpents, snakes. So the Nile is virtually impossible to live in. Nobody wants to live there. Uh, Iraq was like that too, the Tigris and Euphrates. They are even more dangerous when they flood. And the Yellow River of China was like that too. Very dangerous place to live. River valleys are dangerous places to live. So why do people choose to live there? Because they had no choice. They had no choice because the beautiful grasslands that they lived in, in Central Asia, in India, in Rajasthan, in uh, the Sahara Desert, in Arabia, they have now dried up. The animals have often died. There is no water. And so you've got to leave. Before that, you could live off the land. You could have a tent. You could live in a shelter. You could hunt. You could gather food. And you could live very well. But then when the world changes, you can't do that anymore. So therefore you have some people from these desert areas who will go south or north. They will go looking for lands where you still have water, where you still have grass, where you still have forest. So then a lot of people go into what will become black Africa. Some people will go up into Europe. Europe is empty land. You know, because it was covered with ice. Now it's, it's being opened up. The ice is melting. And, um, and then there's some people that do the impossible, which is to go to live in the Nile Valley or the Tigris Euphrates Valley of Iraq or the Yellow River Valley. And also we could talk about the Indus Ganges Valley of India. These are all post Neolithic. And again, as Toynbee points out, that look for the prophet. He doesn't actually say it that way. Toynbee uses words like creative minority, you know, which we could talk about. But we could say look for the prophet. Because what Toynbee is saying that look, to make the transition of leaving the assumed pastoral life of the vast grasslands of the Sahara and Central Asia, and Central India, and Arabia, and to go into these river valleys, there has to be massive social change. And there has to be a fundamental restructure of society, organization of society. And Toynbee believes this required very special people. And Toynbee wouldn't be bothered if he said prophet, because we would say that's the work of a prophet. But he said that it had to be there. And he calls them creative minorities. That are just minorities. And that when people's following by, uh, what is the word that he uses? Um, mm -hmm. By, it's a word that means like affability. Like they're, they're very pleasant. They're very nice. You want to follow them. They don't make you follow them. You want to follow the prophet. He's so beautiful. So he wins you by charm. That, that's probably the word that time he uses. They, they dominate by charm. And look, we can show you a new way to live. We will be just to you. And that's why also, um, you know, the beginning of civilization, which is the beginning of these cities that were, and again, we, will, we have to talk about this a little bit further too, because there may be worse cities before that. But the, the cities of Egypt and of Iran and of China, you know, this is a major transition. And it requires uh, lots of things. But first of all, you have to protect people from the river. You have to build up the land. Uh, you have to do all sorts of things. And you've got to have government. You didn't have to have government before. The Arabs never had government. They didn't have rulers. They didn't have kings. And, uh, you know, you have got to also, um, you know, provide for the people with agriculture. You've got to store the food. You have to distribute the food. There are all sorts of things. 
So these are, uh, this is a major change in history. But it's uh, a response to the challenge of the deserts that are spreading in the world. And so here you have the first cities that we know of. Again, was that progress? You know, it's change. And it is monumental change. And Toynbee would say that when it begins, and this is a lot, is intuition, not historical proof. But you know, historians always try to figure it out, and then you look for evidence. But he, he would say that when this began, it, must, it was a very noble society. And it was a very just society. And then oppression comes in. The uh, creative minority is replaced by the dominant minority, an elite that wants power and privilege. And they begin to oppress the people. And then they also divide the people. And some have wealth, some don't have wealth. Some have access to privilege, some don't. And so like when we look at ancient Egypt, who do we think of? Pharaohs, right? And Tony would say, you must look further, because it couldn't have been that way. It couldn't have been that way. And there's evidence for that in Egyptian mythology and Egyptian history. Tony doesn't just make it up. But he said that there was a period in Egypt, which is, we could say, the prophetic period, in which um, there is justice and there is harmony. And then that is broken by the domination that will lead to the emergence of Pharaonic Egyptian Egypt, and then you have the oppression and the dominance of the favorites that come in. Okay? And you have something similar to that that may happen in other places as well. But again, it's like, uh, it's really important you know, for us you know, to look at this big picture and you know, to be able to understand the development of civilization in the right way. Um, Okay, so what we don't want is an unimagined or poorly imagined pre-city past. In other words, don't assume that just because what human beings were, were doing in the Sahara Desert when it wasn't desert, or what they were doing in Arabia when it wasn't desert, don't assume that this was backward or uncivilized just because they didn't build cities, just because they didn't have organization. Because you can't make that assumption. And these are people who did not leave us much in the way of relics. Like the pharaohs leave all kinds of stuff. But you know, you cannot assume that the story of the pharaohs is any more true, or is any more real, or is even better than the people who don't leave evidence. What kind of archaeological evidence would Abraham have left other than the copy? He built the cow. He rebuilt the cow. But you know, his tents and his flocks and so forth. What kind of reference? They don't need anything. See, and then to judge him on that basis, like these were backward people, you see, that, that, that's not thinking out. It's, it's not thinking properly. Um, so, um, in any case, Arabia uh, is the major formative area of Near, Near Eastern civilization. All Near Eastern civilization, Egyptian, Babylonian, Syrian, all of it comes out of Arabia. And so therefore, Arabia is really important. You'll notice that uh, when we study ancient history, that we never talk about Arabia. You just talk about Egypt, you talk about Mesopotamia, and you might talk about something else. There are a lot of other interesting things to talk about. What about Gambia? What about the Gambian River Valley? That's also ancient. That's really ancient, really. And there you have rice cultivation. There you have mango cultivation, cashew uh, cultivation. And that, but and like, what was going on in Gambia? That's very interesting. Nobody studies that. Most because like these are Africans. They can't give me a break. It's like they had civilization. <laughs> Were they human just like you? Know? The Olmec civilization of America. You know, those were Africans. Those were Africans. 500 BC. Probably coming out of Gambia. Probably coming out of the Gambian River. You know, we, we have a lot of work to do. This is really important. But um, Arabia is the formative area of all Near Eastern civilization that we know. Sumerian, Semitic, 
Egyptian, the civilized populations, the city builders of the ancient Near East all had their roots in Arabia, including the Egyptians. And the evidence of Arabian rock art indicates that there were probably these different, all these ethnic groups there. Okay? Uh, now, um, I just want to, is it, I, I tried to put this together this morning, and so it's not, not carefully done, but uh, I want to have something that you can look at. Makes it a little bit easier for you to follow, I hope. But here we have to make another point. And this is like the Arabic language. Uh, what kind of a language is Arabic? What family does it belong to? Semitic. Semitic. And we usually call it Hamido-Semitic. Hamido-Semitic. And today, a lot of people prefer to call it Afro-Asian. It's like they say Indo-European. They don't say Yafathite. Yafathite, you know, they say Indo-European. And uh, these are big families, you know. You have in Africa, the Afro-Asian family is one of the biggest ones. A lot of the Semitic languages are spoken in Africa. Ethiopic, Tigray, Tigrenya, and then you have uh, Hamitic languages like Berber and Hausa and so forth. And then you have also uh, languages in between, which is Old Egyptian. Old Egyptian is, you can't say, you can't put it in one camp or the other, but it's closer to Semitic than it is to Hamitic. Okay, so that's the family that Arabic belongs to. And uh, what are other languages that belong to that family? Hebrews. Hebrew, Aramaic, Syria, lots of them. Um, some of the languages in the family are ancient, some are middle, some are new, modern. Only one is modern, not many. Um, what is the most ancient of all the languages that we know? that belong to the Hamido semitic family. What is the most ancient? What would you say? Yeah. Aramaic. Aramaic. You're just guessing. <laughs> this is all right. It's all right. It's all right. What would you say? I was going to say Hebrew. No. The most ancient of them all is Arabic. That's very important. And uh, a lot of your right-wing Christians are not going to tell you that. In fact, they have things out, websites out, talking about how Hebrew is older than Arabic, and Aramaic is older than Absolutely not. Hebrew is Middle Semitic. Arabic is the most ancient form of Semitic known. So this is something very important also. Um, some linguists theorize that Afro-Asian, the Afro-Asian proto-language, that is the old, old language from which Arabic and Hebrew all come, was spoken during the 5th millennium BC. Like there was a language that all these people spoke together, um, you know, like 4000 BC, at the end of the Neolithic. But their Russian scholars, of Vladimir Oral and Olga Stolbova, they wrote in 1995, they have a very important Dictionary of America of Comparative Semitic, Amido Semitic, they suggest that this proto language should be dated around 10,000 or 9,000 BC. And because Arabic is so close to it, then uh, we can very easily argue that the way that the Prophet spoke Arabic, the way that the Arabic language is expressed in the Quran, this is the way that the people, the, the Arabian speakers in Arabia were speaking 10,000 BC. That is 12,000 years ago. 9,000 years ago, and maybe even more than that. And this is scientific. This is scientific. Um, ancient Hamido Semitic languages are defined as preserving all. Or, or most of the characteristics of proto hamido semitic So how do linguists work on things like this? How, how do they say that Arabic is ancient and Hebrew is not? You know how they do that? How would they say, for example, that Sanskrit is an ancient language, but English is not? How would they do that? Do any of you have any idea how they do that? <clears throat> so you take the whole family, 
as much of the family as you can. If you take Hamid Semitic, you're going to take Hausa. You will take uh, Tigrenya, Tigre, uh, Amharic, Ethiopic, Berber, all the Berber dialects. You will take Old Egyptian, Coptic. Uh, you will take Hebrew, Aramaic, Nabataean, Palmyran, Akkadian, Amorite, Canaanite, uh, Himuritic, Sabaean, Thamudic, all these languages. What do they have in common? Well, we by seeing what they have in common, then we get an idea of what must have been in the ancient tongue. Because these common elements, you know, they must indicate to us what they had together in the past. This is really important. And it's this kind of linguistic study that enables us to say, for example, what does the word God mean? In English, we say God. What does that word mean? Well, for us, creator, we don't know what it means. Just use the word. But by comparative linguistics, we say it means he who is supplicated. He who is supplicated. Because it's very clear when we put together the proto-language, you see that, um, that uh, the, the root here is a root to supplicate, to pray. And God is the one who is supplicated. Very valuable. Like uh, Dios, Dieu, God. So again, in comparative uh, linguistics, you go back and you say, oh, like this comes from the same root that you get two from in Tuesday. And Ziel in German. And Dio, and this is light. So Dios is the God of light. He is a new. And God is Allah, though he who is worshipped by light. He who is supplicated in prayer. Very valuable. So linguists, when they do this, they will take all these languages together, as many as they can, and then they look for common elements, and on that basis they try to reconstruct what the most ancient form of the language would be. So ancient, ancient Semitic and Hamitic, it had tenween. Baitun, Baitan, Baitin, Rajulun, Rajulan, Rajulin, that's Tenween. It had Ne'rab, Babu, Al-Babu, Al-Baba, Al-Babi, Makkatu, Makkata. The Babylonians would say, Babun, Baban, Babim. So, so Tenween is ancient. The Arab is ancient. Then you see that in the ancient languages, they distinguish between the and a. So ayn and ayn are distinct letters. In Hebrew, they're all the same. In Hebrew, all the ayns become ayns. So they won't say maghrib, they say ma'rib. Okay? And then you see that they distinguish between ha and kha. In Hebrew, it all becomes kha. And you see that they uh, also have ha. And they have uh, 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 hamza, glottal stop. And you see that they have dual. Rajulani, Rajulani, <coughs> Baitani, Baitani, Baitani. And the Quran has the dual. You know, it's amazing. And it's very important in the story of Adam and Eve. Because they're both guilty, not Adam. And not Eve, they're both. They both ate from it. They both came down. Right? The duel. It helps out Alan here. In this case, you know. Um, okay? So you have the duel. You also have, um, you know, the consonantal structures. Like ketaba, kataba. And from that, we will just change it a little bit. Get kitab, maktub, katib, maktaba. Huh? So that's also ancient. And uh, also you can have certain infixes. Like they say, iktatab. Or we say, infa'ala. It's like put a noon in there. And then you have different forms of verbs. Like katab, 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 takatab. Okay? So 
The amazing thing is, is that when you put all these elements together that were there in ancient Semitic, Arabic's got every single one. Every single one, except one particular thing, which may or may not have been in the original language, and that's a type of S, which Thamudin has, but which Arabic doesn't have, which is a type of S. S. Just like when, if you know Spanish, a lot of Spanish, when they say los, they say los, los, los pueblos, pueblos, pueblos. It's a type of S which is, is, is like between an S and a sheen. So ancient Semitic probably had that, Arabic doesn't have it, as seen and sheen. Also, ancient Semitic would distinguish between seen, sheen, and that. And between dal and that, Arabic does all that. So Arabic then is ancient, ancient. And look how rich it is. You know, the, the Jews of Spain and Portugal knew Arabic very well because Arabic was, was cultivated um, brilliantly in Muslim Spain and Portugal. And the great uh, Jewish writers and translators like Ibn Tibun, they always say there's no comparison between Hebrew and Arabic. You know, and we have only so many verb forms. Hebrew lost most of the verb forms. Arabic has how many? You can't, Arabic is infinite. It has an infinite ability to produce meaning from words. The triliteral root, all of that. Okay, so Arabic then is an ancient language. And these languages like Hebrew, Aramaic, Syria, Ethiopic, uh, Ethiopic is very rich. And Hebrew is not, because Hebrew, most of it was lost after the Babylonian captivity. But uh, those are all middle Semitic. That means that they only preserve two-thirds or less of you know, the, uh, the characteristics of the original language. How did Arabic, in, and Arabic is one of the last to be written. Akkadian is one of the first Semitic languages to be written. And it is ancient. You know, but it, it is nothing like Arabic. It was written like 3,300 BC. But it is not as old as Arabic. So how was it that Arabic, which is not written for a long time, how is it that it was able to preserve this purity and this richness? What is the answer to that? There were better in the desert, and so they kept their language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe here we might do something here like this. Did we, did we do, it didn't happen. Now we messed up everything. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So this is Arabia, right? Okay, this is Arabia. Arabia is huge. It's almost as big as India. It could be called, we call it a peninsula, you could call it a subcontinent if you wanted to. And um, you know that it has lots of deserts in it, and it's very difficult terrain. Um, where is the main, what is the major river of Arabia? Where is the Nile or the Tigris Euphrates of, of, of Arabia? Because Egypt has a, is a desert that's much more difficult than Arabia, you know. But uh, Arabia, where is its big river? It doesn't have one. <laughs> right? It has a little tiny river in Terim. <laughs> And, and, and not in Tirim, but outside of Tirim. And that's the river where um, the prophet Hud showed Ad the garden on the, that side of the river, and then he went to a valley where he showed him the fire. Those, that valley is there. I've been there. And he said, if you will believe in me, you will have this garden. And if you disbelieve, you will go to this fire. And they disbelieved, you know. And then all that remains, and they said, that is sorcery. You're just a sorcerer. Like that's an illusion, okay? But then the little river is there, and the people go and they still bathe in it. But it's like a stream. There's no river in Arabia. Um, where are the natural ports? None. No natural port. San Francisco is a natural port. New York City is a natural port. Boston is a natural port. Manila in the Philippines is a natural port. Arabia has no natural ports. 
you have some in the Yemen, but that's way in the south. And so that enables Arabia to go to Africa and to go to India and to get goods, but you know you, you, you can't you, you can't come into Arabia. And if you look at the, the Red Sea, you know, which is right here, um, what kind of a sea is that? Is it shallow or deep? The Red Sea. Is it shallow or deep? It's extremely deep. It's extremely deep because it's created by a fault that separated Arabia from Africa. <coughs> so it's faulted. It's really deep. Profound. And the coasts there, which are rocky coasts often, and sandy sometimes, but what do they have in them? You know? Okay, so the Marjan is there, the Luklu is in the Persian Gulf, right here. This is Luklu, this is pearl country, this is coral country. Well, the whole Arabian coast is big coral reefs. Huge coral reefs. So even if you have a place like Jeddah, which was a port, it's not really a port. Today you have the Islamic port of Jeddah. You know, like you have the Christian port of New York, right? And um, the Islamic port of Jeddah was dug out. You know, There was no port like that. If you come to Jeddah, Jeddah is like the, the place where you come to go to Mecca. But, you know, you have to go to Abhur, which is about maybe 20 miles or so to the north of Jinta, and then you, you can't bring your ship in. You bring in little boats that are filled with goods, and then you wait for a person to come out from Abhur, and he says, oh, you're okay, you can come in, you're not going to conquer us, you're not hostile, and then at sunset, he will lead you through the coral. And it has to be sunset because even he can't see it clearly until that time. And you know, if you touch the coral, you sink. That's all there is to it. Coral will rip. You know, you know the story of the Titanic, and you know how the iceberg ripped the Titanic open. Icebergs are nothing compared to coral. Coral will scissor it open, just like that. So you, you, he will bring you in. You unload all of your goods, and you take them by donkey or mule or camel to Jinta and you sell it. That's the way it was for hundreds of years. Maybe even more than that. Yen Bu'ar in the north is the same way. There you go from there to Yathrib, to Medina. So there's no natural port. And all, as much as the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians wanted to conquer Arabia, because they believed it was Felix Arabia, it is happy Arabia, the land of spices and myrrh, and the gods, all of them believed Arabia was holy. All the ancient people of the Middle East believed Arabia was holy land. The Egyptians, without all, we'll talk about that. They all believed it was holy. But they can't conquer it because they can't get their ships. They, if they get their ships in the Red Sea, the ships have got to stay out to sea. If they approach the coast, they will sink. They'll be sunk by the coral. So this is God's, this is a sign of God. This history, a sign of God in creation. The Arabian Peninsula is. Okay, and then the Persian Gulf, right here, this is where the pearls are. The, this is where the pearls come from. Why? What is the Persian Gulf like? Is it deep or shallow? Shallow. Extremely shallow. Dangerously shallow. And very sandy. And there you have pearls because it's hot. Hot water. Really hot. Red Sea can be cold because it's so deep. Okay, but that is hot and it produces pearls. You have to dive down to get them. They're big pearls. Okay, and then these are boat people too. But what kind of boats do they use? They use the Dao. The Dao, you know, which which are boats that are really seaworthy. They're amazing boats, but you can push them on the sand and push them off the sand, because there are no ports, <coughs> see? So, um, big Greek ships and Roman ships, they're finished. They try to come ashore, they will get hung up in the sand, and there's nothing you can do. 
You know, so this this is amazing. This is really amazing. And then Arabia itself is a desert, beautiful desert. Beautiful desert, especially the Hejaz, mountains of the Hejaz. Many of you have been there. Beautiful mountains, very high, very difficult. This is all lava flow. That's why we call it Hejaz. It's all covered with uh, lava flow, rocks that will cut you, obsidian, pumice. That's why it's Hejaz. It is the barrier. You cannot go there without a guide. And you cannot go there if the tribes don't want you, because they will attack you. They know all the places to go. They know all the pathways. You don't. And they will attack you. So if you want to go, you have to have their permission. The ancient Jews and Christians had that permission. Ancient Jews and Christians took refuge in Arabia when they were being tormented and persecuted and killed by other people. Um, but the Hijaz is very beautiful. And then you have in the Hijaz, you have mountains that get rain, and you have forests in the mountains, and you have lions, and you have leopards, and ostriches, and you have all kinds of animals, the oryx, you know, but those are in areas that catch the rain and keep it, and you have to know where those are. They're still there, but you have to go in the mountains to know where they are, and they belong to the tribes. And they are tribal territory. You, you don't go there without permission. The tribes all, we keep this for ourselves. So Arabia is able to produce food. And it is able to sustain large tribes. Powerful tribes. But nobody can touch them. And this is very important. So this keeps Arabia a single Geographical unit. What about culture? What about culture? Allah made the Kaaba, the house of God, He made it a protector of the people. Because Abraham, around 2000 BC, Abraham rebuilds the Kaaba. He and Ishmael. And then he calls all of the Arab tribes to come to, to make pilgrimage. And God says the Kaaba is Qiyam Linnas. It is the protector of the people. It takes care of the people. Because they don't have a king. They don't have a governor. Or Shahr al-Haram. And the sacred month. Meaning the sacred months. How many were the sacred months? Huh? Four. Four. And what are they? Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram and Rajab al Fard. Rajab al Fard. Rajab is the seventh month. Okay, but the eleventh month, the twelfth month, the first month, those are sacred months for pilgrimage. And Rajab is in the middle of the year for Umrah. Okay? And these are sacred months, one third of the year. You cannot fight. You cannot kill. You cannot shed blood. Did the Arabs respect that? Absolutely. They did. They don't anymore. But in pre Islamic Arabia, they respected that for over 2,000 years. And this is what we, this is what we hear from the Sahaba. They say a man would meet the murderer of his father in the sacred month. Like, there he is. He killed my father. The murderer of his brother, and he would not touch him. Because you cannot fight in that month. It was totally taboo. And Umar says that God would punish people who did it. That's why they do like the Kaaba. You don't touch the Kaaba. God will destroy you. And Abraha, Abraha learns that the hard way. The Arabs knew we don't do anything. This is the house of God. God will destroy him. And the sacred, see, so what do the sacred months do? The sacred months enable these tribes to have no government. They have no ruler. It enables them to make peace, to live together, to intermarry, to trade, and to go to Mecca, to visit the sacred house. Okay? This is one third of the year. And then also, what does that do? 
They're coming together to Mecca, they're going to Hajj, and then what are they speaking? Pure Arabic. So they have different ways of speaking. They have different dialectical variations, but they can all understand each other. Why? Because of Abraham. Had Arabia not had the Kaaba, then these Arabian forms of speech, which are very ancient, they would have developed into languages. Okay? Because they're isolated. But that's not what happens. Ja'alallahu al Kaaba al Bayt al Haram. Qiyaman lil Nas. See, the Kaaba will bring them all to Mecca so they all listen to Quraysh or they listen to Jurhum or whoever is here. They have, they understand each other. And then, will Qalat, will Hedji, will Qalat. And the sacrificial victim. What is the sacrificial victim? The Hadi. What is it? The camel that you're going to sacrifice in Mecca? The cow you're going, or the steer or the bull you're going to sacrifice in Mecca? The sheep or the goat? Okay, and you mark it. And then you wound it in the right hump. And then you put sandals over it or garlands over it. And why do you do that? Because then everybody knows that you're going to Mecca. You cannot be touched. So I want to go to Mecca, not in the Rajiv, not in the sacred months. I want to go in whatever I want. Okay, then you take the heady and no one will touch you. Because you've got the heady. And then when you come back, you put on the qala'id. The qala'id are the garlands. And that they are garlands of idhkar. Idhkar is a beautiful plant in Mecca. It's almost only in Mecca. And it's the only plant in Mecca that you can pull up. Because they use it for garlands. And they use it for medicine. And they put it in their roofs because it smells beautiful. And then you come home with Ibqar, so everybody says, coming from Mecca, don't touch him. So and this was really respected in, in pre-Islamic Arabia. So this keeps the culture a united culture. And it keeps it ready to receive the unlettered prophet. So these are signs of God. This is amazing. But then Arabia, you've got to study this continent. You've got and, and see that's what our Western historians, it's like. You know, see, up here you have right, greater Syria. Here you have Egypt. Here you have Mesopotamia. So it's like they put their back to Arabia, and they look at Syria, they look at Egypt, they look at Babylonia. They never look south. And it's like all these people are coming from the south. You know, what is the relation between that and the north? They never look at that. It's a blind spot. And we have to say, let's remove the blinkers and take a look. You'll see it's very beautiful. Very beautiful. It's really amazing. And this also brings out another issue, you know, which is the fact that you know, the uh, Arabians, uh, they were the most faithful of all of the children of Abraham. They received the truth from Abraham. He rebuilds the Kaaba with Ishmael. And they hold to the way of Abraham for thousands of years more than any of the other children of Abraham, more than the children of Isaac, more than the children of Jacob. And this has also to do with the stability of their environment. And some of our scholars uh, you know, write about that really beautifully. They have amazing things to say about that, but that's the truth. You know, the corruption of Abrahamic religion, which brings in the idols and the polytheism, that's only generations before the Prophet Muhammad It's only a few hundred years before the Prophet Muhammad For thousands of years before that, they held to the way of Abraham. And again, Arabia helped them to do that. It's, it's very, very important. Um, so, uh, Arabic is ancient, right? The great literary languages of Hamid semitic are Akkadian, which was written in Iraq, 3300 BC. Old Egyptian, which was written with hieroglyphics. Um, Syria, Syria and Aramaic are the same language. Ethiopic and Arabic. These are the literary languages, the ones that produce poetry and books and things like that. Of all these, only Akkadian, Old Egyptian, and Arabic are ancient. All the rest are middles, Semitic. And of these, the most ancient, hands down, 
is Arabic. Very, very important. Okay, so um, I want to go a little bit further and then we'll pause, okay? Uh, Dilmun, the largest ancient necropolis. Um, where is Dilmun? Who knows? Where is Dilmun? Sorry? Um, Dilmun is in Bahrain. And Dilmun is also in Eastern Arabia. Uh, where you have the city of Bahram today, the oil city of Bahram. Dil, that was the city of, that's the land of Dilmun. And that is an ancient land of the Sumerians. And in Bahrain, in Dilmun, and in Bahram, in Eastern Arabia, you have the largest necropolis of the ancient world. Okay, and um, at first when they begin to study, what is a necropolis? City, right? Metropolis. Metropolis. Hmm? Uh, polis is city. Necro is what? Necrophilia. Dead. Death. Dead people. So these are the cities of the dead, which are cemeteries. Uh, ne necropolis is a big city of the dead with lots of tombs and you know, funeral cults and things like that. The biggest necropolis of the ancient world is in Bahrain in Eastern Arabia. Nothing like it in Egypt. Nothing like it in Babylonia. Um, the first estimates were that there were about a hundred thousand tumuli. Tumuli are like big tombs. And these are all like beehives. They are made of big stones that were brought from someplace else, not from Bahrain. And they're made in big, like beehives. You have a door to go in, and then you have burial chambers in them. Some of them are a meter high, some are 12 meters high, like 40 feet high. And they're big. Uh, today we say there's about 150,000 of them. A lot of them are never used. At least we don't know that they were ever used. The general view is they date back to like 3000 BC, 2000 BC, 2500 BC, time of the Sumerians. No ancient cemeteries of comparable size are known to exist anywhere in the ancient, in the Near East. And they had elaborate funeral cults of second burials. These were second burials. In other words, the people buried there, they don't come from Bahrain. They don't come from Bahrain. Where do you think they come from? Babylonia. Mm -hmm. They come from Mesopotamia. They're Iraqis. But they're Sumerians. Okay, and why do they do that? Why do they want to take their dead? They dig, they bury their dead in Babylon. Then they make pilgrimage to Dilmun. And they dig up. Well, they don't have to, they dig them up. They have to have funeral chambers in Mesopotamia. They take the bones or the body of the dead person. And they take it to, for, to Dilmun for a second burial. Very, very interesting. Again, this is like 3000 BC, 2000 BC. This is before Abraham, before the prophet Abraham, a thousand years before the prophet Abraham. Why did they do that? Because they believed in the flood. They believed in the flood. Again, very important. Um, everybody believed in the flood. Not just these people. We know Gilgamesh, we know they believed in the flood. But the fact is, all ancient people believed in the flood. All Native Americans, to my knowledge, believed in the flood. They all believed there was a great world flood, and that the Native Americans came here after the flood. And uh, the Chinese believed in the flood. The Indo-Europeans believed in the flood. The Indians believed in the flood. The, the unusual thing in the study of human beings is to find the people who didn't believe in the flood. Almost everybody did. Some people didn't, or at least they don't talk about it. Okay, so they believed in the flood. And um, they believed that the uh, hero of the flood, that's what our historians say, um, was buried in Dilmun. And the hero of the flood is their great, 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 great grandfather. 
whom they refer to as Ziyu Sutra or Utnapishtim or Atra Khasis. Atra Khasis means extremely wise, extremely prudent, and Khasisastra, and Adapa, the son of Ea. That's what they call him. And we would call him Nur. We would call him Noah. So they believed that he was buried there. And they believed that Dilmun was the antechamber. The anti it was the room before. It was the antechamber of the spirit world. And it was the gateway to immortality. And it opened up to the abode of the blessed, the garden. And they felt that if they could get their dead to Dilmun and bury them there, which is holy land, that that would give them eternal life. Okay? So they believed that burial in the necropolis of Dilmun could give, their, uh, give his children, that is the children of Utnapishtim, immortality. Very interesting. Our Islamic belief is that Noah is not buried there. We believe that Noah is buried where? And again, it's not a belief because it's not established by conclusive evidence. It has weak reports. But, you know, you can believe it if you want. It's permissible. But the standard Islamic belief is that Noah is buried where? You know? In Mecca. In Mecca. But he's buried in Arabia. That's the standard belief. So that's actually what they believe. They believe in the same thing, that Noah is buried down there. Why didn't they go to Mecca? Well, how do they know where it is? First of all, they come from Dilmun. That's where their roots go back. And secondly, Mecca, nobody knows where it is. Abraham's the one who's going to rediscover it. He's the one who the house is, is not there anymore. These are very important things, very important stories. And again, who, who, where did you read about that in your history book? And why did you not read about that? See, these are things that we have to bring to light. Um, so, let's see, where do we go from here? Um, there are a lot of things to say. And I have a note here that says that we have to pause for questions. So, um, uh, I want to continue with this, but this could go on for days. And so, um, let's pause for questions. Do you want to take a break first? Okay, so well, let's take a break for a few minutes, inshallah. We will stop for a while, and um, we'll have some questions. And maybe we have answers, I don't know about that. That's the hard part. There's not such a thing as a stupid question. A lot of stupid answers. That's not stupid questions. Yes? Um, for um, you just actually asked just a second ago, um, why did you not read about that in your history book? You were explaining about Muhammad's mm -hmm. belief, uh, Sayyidina Nuhu's belief to be buried in Mecca, but Mecca had to be rediscovered by Ibrahim. And mm -hmm. This synthesis that you're bringing, this amazing synthesis of, of ancient uh, Arabian history, I, I, is, is, is there any books we can read about that? Uh, where, where does this history come from? Uh, or is it more from all your readings as a synthesis that you, you put together? If there's yeah. any good materials for us to read on this, it would be helpful to get um, on this. You know, my, um, I, I'm so sorry, I was, just, I, was, I was listening to you, but it's like I lost stuff here. I, you know, when I, I don't know. Sometimes I make big mistakes, but I lost stuff here. Primitive. I had something about primitive. I don't see it. Hmm. Okay, so this is, um, in any way, um, uh, you know, to put history in a book is um, very important. And um, that's always a later stage of development. And um, the things that we're talking about are things that um, have been gleaned for like maybe 50 years of reading <coughs> and uh, from articles and from different books and histories and things like that. Um, history, especially if you want to do real history, uh, you can't follow the narrative. The narrative is not adequate. So, you know, you've got to study it on your own. And there's amazing material there for everything. But, you know, it requires that you do extensive reading. 
and it requires looking at articles and and, and other things like that. Okay, so um, I don't know any book like for this. I can give you articles, for example. I can give you articles that you can read, but um, we have to write books like that. And um, may Allah enable us to do that. It's very important. We have lots of things to do. You know, uh, we have to write the history of America. Really, we do. We have to write the history of America. We have to write the history of Europe. There were Muslims in Switzerland 150 years. 150 years there were Muslims in Switzerland, in the mountains of Switzerland, under the Caliphate of Cordoba. And they made the Pope pay jizya three times. And Toynbee says that that's one of the most important events of the early Middle Ages. They're there from about 900 to about uh, 1050. See, and, and you can find that out. You can study that. You can find books about that. You can find articles about that. But like, this is something people don't ever talk about. Um, you know, there are many things like that. So, again, you know, um, history gives you identity. But history also reflects identity. So, alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim. And I believe in Islam. And having been to the Muslim world, uh, to Spain and Portugal, which are parts of the Muslim world, even though, unfortunately, they're like museums, you know, and you have like the skeletons of the dinosaurs, you don't have the dinosaurs anymore, and Morocco, and Indonesia, and Malaysia, and China, and India, you know, so I know like this was a great civilization. These were civilized people. Muslim people. I remember <clears throat> in Morocco uh, taking my son, you know, uh, this was when Imam Hamza had, I think it was the first Rihla in 1998 in Fez. And, you know, I went there to see him for like a day. Were you there? Yeah. And, um, you know, then, uh, you know, I, I had some friends in Fez that we went to see. And, uh, you know, we went to the house of Abdul Aziz al who was a great Moroccan saint, his house, which is in the devout family. And this is an old Moroccan house. And beautiful. In a way that you cannot describe. And, you know, I went to their bathroom. And then I came back. I told my son, you have to go to the bathroom. He said, no, I don't have to go to the bathroom. I said, no, you have to go. I want you to see this bathroom. The way they, it's an old traditional bathroom. It's like so simple and so beautiful and so clean. And it's like, these were civilized people. These were highly civilized people. So it's like, you know, today when we look at the Muslim world, <clears throat> you know, the Muslim world for the last 200 years, or 250 years, has gone through the nosedive. And the fact that it didn't crash is a miracle. But it's like everything that was there was destroyed. And the worst thing that was destroyed was our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of our tradition. And then you see Muslims, we have the greatest innovation in the Muslim world today, which is the nation state. The nation state is an ugly innovation. And I'm not speaking the language of the political Muslims. No, we shall all be one, right? I, I understand you have. No, the nation state, you know, is an apparatus of controlling people you know, that is totally contrary to our heritage and destroys our law, which is a law that is decentralized and gives you freedom and justice. You know, look at Syria. That's a nation state. They control everything. Education, curriculum, they spy on you. They do whatever they want to do, you know, and um, the nation state has destroyed Muslims more than anything else, in my opinion. Okay, so today when you see Muslims, we are down and out. We have no self-respect. A lot of us have self-hate, in fact. It's one of the reasons why we're so unmerciful to each other. And, uh, you know, so, like, you just think, oh, these people produce a great civilization? You know, they can't even, they can't even live together now. So, like, you think, well, the past must be a disaster. But it's not. The past had different kinds of people in it. The past had a different reality. We have to regain the secrets 
that were there that made that civilization. We have to do that. And we can do that. Our schools should do that. Because here we have the, you know, uh, you know, the, the two seas that come together. You know, the two barzakhs. You have the barzakh between the two seas, which is the convert, you know, like C.D. Twist, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, like myself, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, I'm saying, Dr. Jackson, you know, many of us. And then you have the Muslim who is of uh, the extraction of old families, like most of you. But it's like you uh, have the benefit of being here and having good education and also not being exposed to some of the crazy cultural ideas that dominate many Muslim countries today. Things that, like, if you're born there, you're not likely to get out of this. And so, like, you, you have, you, you know, it's like you're able to wake up, like, to understand things. And then when these two come together, they can produce amazing things. They can produce amazing things. They benefit each other tremendously. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, we have a few questions. Yeah. Um, one question here is, what happened to mm -hmm. analytical history slash tarif as a traditional Islamic science, mm -hmm. as embodied in the work of classical scholars like Tabari, Ibn Khaldun, etc., is in quote-unquote dead? Uh, you see, um, traditional analytical history is very valuable as a primary source. A Tabari is very valuable as a primary source. But most of these historians and most pre-modern historians they're not interested in the dynamics of historical change. And also in the Islamic world, there was a certain insularity. So that, you know, Muslims in the past rarely have access to non-Muslims. And so therefore, Tabari is going to tell you about Persia. He would tell you quite a bit about it, but mostly Muslim Persia. He, even if he tells you about ancient Persia, it's not all that accurate. Okay? And, but the Muslim historian is basically going to tell you about what he knows. And then he's going to be very honest, usually. He's going to report all sorts of conflicting information, which is typical in history, and he's not going to sort it out. And um, he's not going to see the big pictures, which are what we look for today. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, you know, Ibn Khaldun is a philosopher of history. And also it's said that he is the author of modern economics. He's the author of modern sociology. So Ibn Khaldun, he begins to do that. Like, let's put this stuff, let's like, like, okay, let's sit back and look at this. Like, what makes a society strong? What makes a society weak? What is the role of economics? What is the role of sociology? What, is, what, what does victory do to you? What does defeat do to you? Those are unique questions. That's why um, Toynbee and, and others, they say that there's never appeared a human mind like Ibn Khaldun. Um, in one great Scottish philosopher, he says, Aristotle and Plato are not his equal. And all others can't even be mentioned next to Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is amazing. But out of Ibn Khaldun, then you get the development of people like Vico, who's a great Italian historian who wants to see how does history work. And then, because you have these big changes in European history, moving from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance to the modern age, then Europeans also, it's like you want to know how does history change? Why do civilizations fall? Why do they rise? And then also Europeans begin to bring in all this information about India, China, America. So uh, the kind of questions that we are interested in finding, you're not going to usually find that in the old books. You've got to figure that out for yourself. Just like if we study Islamic law today, we have to keep an eye on the dynamics of the law. Islamic law in Spain and Portugal and Sicily abolished feudalism. It liberated the serfs. Was that policy? Did they even intend to do that? Maybe not. All they did is they came into Spain and Portugal and Sicily and they applied prophetic law. And one of the effects of it is that it destroyed the feudal system. Whoever revives unused land, fallow land, owns it, Jew, Christian, Muslim, whatever. So like the peasants say, hey, wait a minute. You mean if I go out and 
follow, if I farm this land in the forest, I won't be killed. I won't be hanged. The noble won't hang me. And I will own it. MashaAllah. So Sicily becomes green. Olives are planted everywhere in Spain. They say you couldn't put down your foot without stepping on the olive. And the people become rich, like they never were in history before. Our Muslims, did they know they were causing that? I don't think they did. They don't talk about it. You know? And this creates uh, economic effects that go through all Europe. It produces economic depression in England. You know, and in Holland, because everybody, all the markets want to go south. No markets want to go north. These are, they, this is the modern historian. So the modern historian digs into the past and is looking for big meanings. Sometimes they find this amazing things. See, so uh, the, the, this is work you have to do. You, you cannot be lazy about this. You should study all, like the Muslims of Switzerland. They are, we do have information about them in some Andalusian histories. But almost everything we know about the Muslims of Switzerland comes out of European records. European records. So, um, you know, there's a lot we have to do here. There's a lot to discover. Yeah? Um, another question. Why do we start uh, with the discussion of the beginning of human history with the study of the Old and New Stone Age. Is this the time period and place where the first human being on this one came to be? Well, um, this is the first thing that we know about human beings. And, um, you know, we have a lot of evidence that it was there. And presumably, this would be... I mean, the thing is, is that, you see, people in this period were people who probably lived the way that Adamic people were believed to live that they lived naturally in the world. Um, you know, they made everything they needed. They did not produce cities. They did not produce wealth. They were not interested in gold and silver. And they were not interested in art and things like that. They worshipped God. They believed in God. Okay? So, uh, to say it's an old stone age, and again, it's like even the word, like, why do you have to use that word? See, like, when we talk about primitive, uh, we talk about cognitive frames, this is one of, one, one of the ones I want to talk about. The word primitive. You know, that is a cognitive frame, right? When you hear the word primitive, primitive religion, what do you think of? Backward. What does the word primitive mean linguistically? Sorry? No, linguistically it doesn't. In a semantically, what does it mean? First. That's all it means. Primitive. Pretending to the first. So why don't, if you say primitive, we understand prime. You know, or primary, or principle. But you see, this is, again, Darwinian notions of evolution. Things are really rudimentary, backward, stupid. And then we say, then the first people must have done that. So they have to be primitive. If they're the first people, they couldn't have done anything. So the, 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 we don't buy into that cognitive frame. And that's why Toynbee says the so-called primitive people of the Paleolithic, he said, I don't believe they were that way at all. I believe they were the most spiritual of all human beings. You know, the the Muqarrabin, the Sabiqin. Many of the first generations. And a few of the later ones. We're the later ones. See, so, so when we look at this from our standpoint, and we look at it also from the standpoint of certain informed historians, then we get a different view. There's a German who studied primitive religion. It's the best study of primitive religion. His name is Wilhelm Schmidt, and I had a whole slide about him, but I must have deleted it by mistake. But Wilhelm Schmidt, he writes a book. It's in German. It's called Der Ursprung der Gottesidee. It is the origin of the idea of God. It's about 12 volumes, <laughs> yeah, and never translated into English. And even Germans have a hard time reading it. That's his wife's work. And he collects careful anthropological information, himself and through others, mostly through others, about all primitive people in the world and what they believe about God. So he calls it the origin of the idea of God. And first of all, what is a primitive person? 
But the definition of primitive people in the world today is better expressed as micro societies or kinship societies, because that's all they are. You see, they, they are societies in which you don't have a government. You don't have kings. You don't have administrations. You know, everybody is who they are because of their kinship. So the head may be the elder, the oldest man. Okay, and um, then, you know, you will stand by me because you're my brother, you're my cousin. These are primitive societies, and they usually tend to be small. Although Arabia was a primitive society in that way. It had just kinship groups. It didn't have governance, and it was not backward in any way. They were honorable people with an incredible language. Okay, and um, in primitive societies, though today, there are little isolated societies because that's, you know, kinship groups are protected that way. You have them in certain parts of America, Africa, Asia, Siberia, and so forth. And so he studied all of these little micro-societies. And again, are they older than we are? If I go today to the Tierra del Fuego, in the very south of America, and I see these three tribes that are there that are primitive, uh, aren't they living in 2013 today? Or is it 2013 B.C.? Did we take a time machine there or an airplane? We didn't go there by time machine. We went there in 2013. But we assume that they preserve certain elements of the past. It's just a presumption. And then that becomes a valuable presumption if we look at all micro-societies and compare them and see what they have in common. And when we look at them and we see what they have in common, we find that all of them believe in one God. All of them. Again, what was the narrative you may have heard? That no, they were animists. Because the idea of one God had to be evolutionary. And like the Jews must have developed this, they evolved this idea. No, absolutely not. The Bible doesn't say that. And history doesn't say that. See, and then the early people, they had to worship spirits. They said there were spirits in the trees and spirits in the water. And then they sort of get smarter and they say, well, like, hey, that's just a tree. So let's look at the spirit out of the tree. Then they worship the spirits, and then they say, like, wouldn't it be better to have gods, and then we have families, and then what about just one god? Isn't that a better idea? You know, that's absolutely false. You know, the, the primitive religions all believe in the one god, wherever you find them. Wilhelm Schmidt will give you the names of the god. <laughs> and they usually believe that God is good, and they believe, they always believe God is good, they believe that he is the source of morality, they have marriage, and they believe that marriage is sacred because of God. They believe that adultery is evil. There are very few exceptions to that. Okay? And, um, you know, so this is very valuable. And this is one of the things that Toynbee depends on. Then he said there must, and this is what Schmidt says, he said there must be ancient prophecy. How do people know these things? We could say, well, there could be football too. There's the natural self as well. But, um, you see, and then, so, but this, this is why Tormi says that I believe that primitive people, the ancient, ancient people, were very spiritual, and they believed in one God. And then also, another thing, is that, um, how do you think, how do you think, what, what is essential to your thought? One of the most important things of all is language. You know, if I don't have a language, I cannot think. You know, language is what enables me to look at my thoughts. Language is what enables me to show my thoughts to you. And then you try to look at them, because you have the same words. They may not mean to you what they mean to me, then you're going to work on that. Okay? But this is how we think. So if you want to destroy a people, oh, destroy their language. It's like when the Africans were brought here from West Africa, uh, usually their languages were taken from them. They had very beautiful languages. And they had very beautiful cultures. Very sophisticated cultures. All that's taken apart. All that's taken. And then you will learn English, but it's not going to ever teach you. You know, I'm not going to teach you English grammar, so you know, you just speak it any old way you can. As long as you can obey me, when I say cut the sugar, that's okay. 
And if I say put the sugar in the 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 grinder and 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 uh, press it, that's all I need from you. You know, eat, sleep, drink. You know, work. And you know, you can talk this English any funny way you want it to because you're an immigrant. You know, and you never learned how to speak right. You don't have a good accent. You know, so then, as long as that person has this broken language that has no continuity with the linguistic history of the language,